okay. How can I pick up the pieces when everything breaks with every day? I'm getting older, I feel the weight up on my shoulders. I'm strong enough, I'll rise above. It's all gonna be okay. If I can be anything, I think I'm gonna be me. Happy What Up Wednesday, everybody. I hope you're doing great. I'm glad that you're here on what is apparently everywhere in Europe and the UK and et cetera, et cetera. Well, I'm sure it's not all over Europe. You can't all have snow. That would be a freak of nature and incredible. And yeah, just can't be a thing. I have snow. Do you want to see pictures of my snow? It's been here for six months, but it's still snow. Hi, it's What Up Wednesday, and I'm Healy Dunn, and we are FH Umpires, and we are the FH Umpires third team. And I took last week off. Did anybody notice? If you didn't, totally fine. That was my intention. I decided I wasn't going to do an announcement. I wasn't going to be all, no, you know. I just thought, break. I'm just going to break. And it was good. It was good. I managed to plan a whole bunch of things that I didn't do. Having conversations with my mastermind folks is all about, you know, should we do a whole show on just what we try to get done and we don't? Wouldn't that be fun? And I said, uh, it, I would talk for the whole hour. That would be great. Anyway, I noticed that there's lots of people in here live who normally can't be like Sebastian. William apparently just has better things to do. That's fine. Whatever. Not mad. Uh, but Simon Milford is here and hasn't been here for a while. Uh, Nick, it's good to see you. And Denman, stop it. Just stop it. Just no, please, please. And morning, <laughs> morning wine for Rachel. I was at breakfast with my father yesterday, not yesterday, Monday. I go for breakfast with my dad every Monday morning. And there we were, 9.30, and turned, and there was a gentleman sitting at the bar having a breakfast beer with his eggs. And I thought, all right, you you know, maybe, maybe you just got off the night shift and, and whatever, and maybe you're doing, th this is a good thing for you. Who knows? Uh, Kat here as well is here. Uh, you're in Vandenbossa. Do, do we know each other? I'm gonna give you one of these. Welcome. I'm glad you're here. 
And I hope you enjoy the discussion that we are about to uh, engage with. Okay, Stain says it's not snowing, but it's raining, at least, in Antwerp. And a Trix is here. All of the tricks, the tricky trick trick. Uh, Yoop, there you go. Uh, you just finished cooking, so you're gonna enjoy your dinner. All right, let's not get all, let's not get all talking about food right now. I have a job to do. It's very serious. Ad is here, hello. No practice because of bad weather. Okay. Yay. Oh, regards from Taco. Oh, I hope he's doing okay. I'm gonna send him a note. Uh, please pass all my regards, but I will send him a note. Um, Cat, remind me to send a note to Taco later, okay? Please just help me. <laughs> uh, there you go. No, Ad's been here before. Ad has been here before. Uh, Jolt is here. Always bringing the spice. I appreciate the points and the, you know, the little digs, Jolt. You're one of my favorites, so thank you. You just don't have time to watch this live after I've just said nice things about you? Oh, savage. Very savage. Goddard's is here. Fantastic. Lee is here as well. Peter Winter, hi. And of course, Stefan. Stefan, it's been a few weeks. So I was starting to get a little worried, but I figured you were just really busy with something. I don't know how that could be more important than this, but but there you are. Okay, this is what we're getting into today. Here are our topics. We're gonna talk about a penalty stroker attack, a, a penalty stroke attacker foot on the line, a penalty stroke video referral, multiple cards in a small cluster and proactive communication versus coaching, which is a topic that came up on the server. And I wanted to spend some time really diving into it because I think it's worth us sorting it out. And does that, see, this is what happens for me. It comes up with hand blue, purple piece, blue piece. I don't know. It's probably one of those. Good to see you, Roy. Thanks for popping in. And hi, Andrew. Okay, let's get into our first topic. Hopefully remember how to do this. It's been 10 days and I feel like, I feel like it's the first time. Shh, no comments. Here we are. Wait, here we are. Penalty strokes, stroke attackers foot on the line. Goalkeepers left. Adam Sanchez scored a hat trick. If she finishes on three, she has scored seven in a game before. So this came out of the Pro League series down in New Zealand. China was there. The US were there. New Zealand was obviously there because they were hosting. And there was some conversation about this particular stroke taker and Simon Mesa noticed on this particular stroke that she had a bit of unusual footwork. And I wanted to dive into it sort of quickly because it's an interesting question. And the poll when, uh, when Kat has an opportunity to have a look at it is what would your call be on in this situation? Would it be a goal? Would it be a retake? Would it be a free hit for the defense? Would you throw confetti on the field? What would your call be in this situation? Because you don't see this very often. Okay. Very Calgary-like in Scotland. There you go. Okay, so have lots of looks at this. And maybe what I'll do for context, I, I cut that portion out of the clip that I edited it, but edited it, but Simon Mason did mention that this player got hauled up on this, on her penalty stroke earlier. So I went back through about seven of China's games just prior to this and couldn't find one where number two stepped up and had this, had, had, a, had a decision made on one of her penalty strokes. I did find this instance here and it looks very much like, is that the same one? No, that's, I may have accidentally programmed the same one. Let's try this and see if it looks different. No, that's the very same one. Fantastic. Anyway, the point being, 
I didn't find one where a penalty stroke was ruled out. So let's explore this. <laughs> and um, hi, David, good to see you first of all. And can I please give you a little bit of love? Because you remembered, even though you are not a hockey person, even though you're not a hockey umpire, the dragging is a question involved in penalty strokes. That's not what in, is in contention here, but one of the even less known, less paid attention to rules. So let's have a quick look at that. I'm just gonna hide that one for a second. But this is uh, the first several sub clauses of 13.7. And we can see the rule specifically states that the player taking the stroke must stand behind. Is this gonna work? Okay, must stand behind. And I can turn on the, the graphic. Don't be all like that. I know what you're already thinking. You're already thinking this Keely, she's, she's lost track of stuff. You're absolutely right. So the player must stand behind the stroke and within playing distance of the ball before beginning. What does stand behind actually mean? And why do we care? This is what I wanna talk about because I'm not super sure how much I care about this, okay? I'll go back to the replay. I'm gonna dive into your comments a little bit. I ho hope that the poll is up. I don't have the right screen going on live. I can go into the studio. Let's just see. Go live is terrifying in YouTube studio. Don't do it, don't do it. David's already said that he would like a free hit for the defense. There you go. Pulling motion, not a pushing. Flicking motion is what we'd be looking for. So Andrew, I'm not sure if you're declaring, if you're responding to what dragging is or you're asserting that dragging is happening in this situation. I'd like to hear that. Front foot goes a long way forwards, but back foot is still in front of the goal. So everybody's talking about the dragging. I believe this is the logical fallacy of the red herring that we just dangled a little bit in front of you about dragging and David, you, you led everybody down a garden path here. Kudos to you, sir. Kudos to you. Ben Horton, you don't know whether you'd penalize the action, either retake or goal because it was scored. It can't be a free hit defense, surely. This is one of my favorite UKisms when y'all ask a question and you say surely after it. Because if you're sure, why are you asking a question? Hmm. I think it means that you're not sure. And you're correct not to be sure. It's a wise choice to ask a question in this situation and try to flush it out rather than to make a statement that something surely is one way or the other. For Nick, it's a goal for him if there had been if there would had been an issue with it, you're about to receive a learning point. <laughs> And there you go. Denman, how do you define standing behind? Okay, there you go. That's what we're asserting. <laughs> the front foot is not behind the ball. And so does the front foot define where somebody is standing? I want to make sure we're in agreement about that. If that is what the consensus view is, then it starts leading us down a particular thing. But if we're looking at body position a little bit more and that sort of thing, if I'm going to be consistent about what I feel about dragging the ball on the penalty stroke, then the foot position is everything. The foot position is what we determine what is behind, what is in front, all that sort of thing. So hand up right now. All right, I, got, I have to eat my dinner here. It's by the foot position. And Steven, <laughs> you're not, you're not sorry, David, you're not sorry. And I'm okay with that. And Peter, before beginning the stroke, absolutely. This is a really good point as well. Before beginning the stroke, nothing prescribed during the ball moving action goal for you. Or maybe if we say that a little bit more clearly, we'd say before beginning the stroke is hang on, let me pull up the, the clause again. 
what at what point is before beginning the stroke and what begins the stroke there's a lot of a lot of rules in this a lot of phrases in this that we don't think about that are undefined and i'm still asking the question feel free to pick it up anybody i'm still asking the question does it matter okay let me know because maybe it does maybe it doesn't um let's see that is steven's comment here it's whether the stroke when is the stroke started being taken the front foot is level when the ball starts moving she's certainly let me just i mean i don't i don't think i i really need to pause this is really good camera work for once where we see that right here i mean angles can always be an issue we all understand that but i think we can say with fair certainty that that is not behind that is not behind that that is in fact in line with the ball so for all of you who have taken penalty strokes in your lifetime you've trained the skill you've scored goals you have missed medal winning matches by taking a penalty stroke wide i mean i'm not talking about anybody in particular definitely not me but for those of you who train this skill what does the foot position mean for a potential advantage that you gain in this situation so when we talk about dragging and we talk about what it looks like when a player is able to um hey any time that you want to start playing that would be super cool i'm gonna do this and then i'm gonna do this okay so we know that the foot position is crucial about determining what a drag is is because the ball can be picked up from behind the player's body it can be pulled along and then it can be released closer to the goal which shortens the distance makes it harder for the goalkeeper to anticipate the direction of the ball blah 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 does that same action does that same factor come into play with the front foot does the front foot being in line with the ball or being ahead of the ball mean that the player can release the ball closer to the goal for example can they impart a significant greater amount of power to the ball that is what i'm wondering and somebody's mouse is just not awake hi i'm gonna keep talking while i troubleshoot and bogey okay um while i wake up my trackpad and get this moving No, it's just disappeared. This is fun, you guys. This is really fun. Lee, at the very start, her foot appears to be level or slightly in front of the ball before the step. It's a goal for Goddard's. And then, if I could scroll, I'd be able to tell you more. There, there, there. Gotcha. I found it. So whoever put their money on within the first 20 minutes, you win. You win. Okay, Andrew. Yeah, exactly. Okay, great. Andrew, you're asking the same question because I failed to read ahead. Is standing behind involving 100% of the body? Is it 95? Is it less than 50%? Oh, Rado, good to see you. The stick is in contact before the foot is on the ground. No drag, so a goal. Yeah, definitely not a, not a drag. I agree. Uh, add. The last foot is standing still on the spot. So it's a goal for you. You say goal. 
says Stefan. The player is taking a large step forward. The rear foot is still in front of the ball. Uh, I think you mean still behind the ball. Sticks is in full contact and it's pushed forward. Okay, just a thought. Ooh, I like these. I like thoughts. Yoop. Not sure if you agree. Of course, that's okay. Thank you for disclaiming your own thought. For a PC, standing behind the line means both feet need to be behind the ball. Would it be the same here? Um, let's see. For the PC, both feet need to be behind the ball. Where does that come into play? Are you referring to rule 13.5? Where the player injecting the ball has to have at least one foot outside the field. And this is the interesting part. This is what I immediately thought of when I looked at 13.7 and I thought, well, there's not a specific rule that explains to us that this is not a big deal. So this knowing that if a an attacker has lined up improperly and as an injector, I can tell you that if I didn't have to have one of my feet outside the line, I would be able to drag with much more force. I'd be able to cut down the distance the ball travels because I could drag that injection from behind me and pull it into the field and then release it with more force, maybe more accuracy. That would always be helpful. And even if that's done, even if that's the case, we say, eh. If that goes to a video referral, a goal will stand. We know that it's just a technicality that nobody cares about. And then for us here, if you catch it on the field, then the penalty corner is just taken again. Okay, so if it's, if it's noticed in the moment, the ball is injected, and everybody has broken at the correct time, everybody else was lined up properly, blah, 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 blah. We just take it again. So, uh, Tristan, is this a case of the rules not being able to fully cover the edge cases of what you can do at penalty stroke? Oh, yeah, you don't say. <laughs> you mean there's something that's not explicitly covered in the rules? Absolutely. This is, pr this is rare and why I believe it's rare is because I don't think it gives you much of an advantage at all. I don't think it changes anything because as long as your back foot is where it needs to be, which isn't explicitly defined by the rules, but is what I consider to be the line in the, 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 the hot line in the sand for whether a dragging motion has occurred or not. But it, as long as the back foot, and her back foot is well behind the ball. So even though she steps, you know, she can start there, she lifts up her foot before she starts dragging the ball. So who knows where her foot actually is? Except before the stroke is taken, arguably, it's in line with the ball. But once she steps forward like that, is she, does that make, does the fact that she starts with her foot there mean that she can step further forward on the stroke? I don't think it does. I just don't see how this could matter, but I'm here to listen to, like you, I, I wanna gather the information because I've never had to think about this before, like this. Is it like the whole ball over the whole of the line, the whole body behind the ball? Uh, yeah, but. How can you, how can you determine that Peter? Because body shape and, and how people lean and where they stand, ooh, I don't, I don't want to have to make that kind of de determination. It seems dumb. Behind the line on PC is the rule. Okay. Um, so it should be the same for the penalty stroke. Okay. So, oh, you mean for defending a penalty corner, the players have to be behind the line, but the players, yeah, their feet have to be behind the line but not their bodies. They can be leaning across the plane of the imaginary line that extends upwards into the sky. Their stick can be extended into the pitch so long as it's not touching the ground. And a player can move their feet. Absolutely right, Rado. Very true. Uh, Stain, if the foot position is an issue. Yeah, and of course, this is, this is the core. And I bet I'm clapping and you can't hear it which is a real shame because actually it's better for yours. But this is the thing. 
this is a proactive step, something that you just want to correct before the stroke is even taken, before the penalty corner is taken. You want to shuffle the players behind the line uh, who are defending. You want to get the injector's feet aligned properly. Otherwise, it's a gotcha. Nobody likes a gotcha. If the stroke doesn't say it has to be one fluid motion anyway, she can start behind it stationary, do a little dance, and then play it. Um, yeah, I mean, she can't faint, so fluid motion, let's not get, let's not get into that rabbit hole. That would be really bad. Got hers. The feet are behind before she starts her motion to take. Well, it depends on when you define the motion to take, right, Goddess? Hi, Ryan. We're doing great. Thanks for thanks for coming in. Yeah. Uh, do do do. Hello, Eskil. Good to see you, and I am glad that you're here live. Either way, neither umpire could tell. Surely. There's the Shirley again. I'm going to hammer that out of everybody along with short corner shuffles, long corner, all those yards. Um, the filming company in New Zealand usually do rugby and they're very professional. They had good chats to set up the good angles or all. Yeah, that's, they did a great job. Fantastic. If the umpire spotted this not being level, would they be allowed to mention it? Would that be coaching? Um, let's not jump to question three or topic three too early denman you clever gentleman you so your argument blair here is that she gains an advantage transferring her weight but the transfer of weight is where she generates her power but can she transfer that weight more effectively the further ahead her foot starts before she goes to play the ball when you watch most stroke takers in order to generate the most power and when they got rid of the hole, you had to start within a stick length of the ball, all that kind of thing on the penalty strokes. When players could start playing distance away and it got a little bit further because, you know, whatever. Players like me, I will take my three steps. I'll do my crab step in order to generate my power power being in air quotes and the fact that I can start a little bit further away and build my momentum towards the ball is how I can actually get more power into that stroke. So starting with your weight forward and then going even more forward, right? So that's my question. I don't, I see this as a, as a disadvantage really because her weight's already quite forward and then she just tries to go even more forward, right? Like, what am I missing? What am I missing here? Um, is a retake only if a goalkeeper fouls no goal or defender shoots before the whistle? Any other attacker foul is a free hit defense. Excellent question. Let's make sure now, you see what I could have done is I could have said, yeah, but we're going to check the rules because it's the right thing to do. Okay, so I'm getting to set 13.7. Here we go. Do, do, do. I have so many places I can look. Okay. I'm like, where will my glasses focus the best? Nowhere. So the player defending the stroke must stand with their feet on the goal line. And when they're in there, okay, so we've got H here, which is the player taking the stroke must not take it until the whistle is blown. Okay. We have next page. And then we have 39. That's the section I should have started with. The stroke is taken before the whistle is blown and a goal is scored. The penalty stroke is taken again. The stroke is taken before the whistle is blown and a goal is not scored. Then a free push is awarded to the defense. Okay, so they just give up their opportunity. So that's kind of like 
that's kind of like a um a it's kind of like a foul being blown okay so and that's a retake any other offense by the player taking the stroke a free push is awarded to the defense okay so that is according to the rules that's how you would in you should interpret that rule if the player if the attacker takes the stroke and the front foot is in line they're not starting behind the ball starting in line is not good enough then should be a free hit to the front technically from a coaching perspective the distance of the rear foot of the ball determines the amount of drag a player can part the ball yep that's why you see many players let's see if you finish this thought i don't know where it is Can I freeze when the first when the stick first touches the ball? The step looks like it takes place before this to you. Okay. <coughs> I know why it's not doing that. Okay. Oops. So let's see what I can do here to help out in this situation. Okay, so the stick is not in contact with the ball here. And, oh. Stick is still not in contact with the ball. Foot is up and clearly ahead. Okay, and that's basically where pickup is. Maybe what would be helpful is to compare. And I know this is getting really academic and in the weeds. We've met. This is what I do. But it is an interesting point to figure out the different stances that players are dressing the ball in when they actually gather the ball. And how that impacts. Okay, so let's see. Ah, buff behind the line. Yeah, so is a defender. Okay, gotcha. Okay. Yeah. But we all know that when it comes to these big decisions, getting back to Blair's point here about gaining any advantage, the, the colliery is, I know I'm going back and forth on this. The colliery is, but the rule is just, it's there. And when it comes to penalty strokes, when it comes to the ball going over the line, when it comes to these things, are we applying what we understand to be, eh, nobody cares. So we're just gonna go ahead and play this. Is that the right way to handle this? Uh, Sebastian, in 13.6, many injectors raise their foot while injecting during a PC, which is then no longer outside, but nor is it inside yet. Nobody seems to care, should they? Many injectors, so which foot are they raising? Sebastian, I don't want to assume if you're talking about the back foot. Maybe you are. Joran. Let me see if I can get this moving again. Will it play? No. Let's try this. If both feet start behind the ball, then the attacker can make an extra step before playing the ball. So even if you can't start in this position, you can always release it like this. Right? Good point. I like that, Joran. Thank you. Your gut. I, oof. Your gut is now a stroke awarded for something egregious or denying a good opportunity. In the case of nitpicking over a centimeter or so, don't be over officious. Good instinct. Simon, uh, the foot's in the air, but behind the plane of the back line is still outside the field of play. But, but we don't apply that criterion to penalty corner defending. Her arms work, how her arms work shows a pushing motion as well. Yeah, no, it, yeah, and we're not talking about a drag, <laughs> okay? I don't care whether it's a drag, because it, for me, it's clearly not a drag. The question is, there's an explicit rule that this breaks. It's this one. This is the rule, sub D, okay? 
This is the rule. Okay, the dragging thing comes later in the clauses. Right? Okay, let's get this poll closed, sure. <laughs> and don't call me Shirley. Hi, Ian. Uh, okay, I will see you on the catch up. Freddy, the deception is caused due to the drag from the step. Freddy, there is no drag here. No, no, no. I'm shutting it down. There is no drag here. Do not use that word <laughs> because it doesn't qualify. Her back foot has to be in front of the ball in order for her to pull that ball from behind her, which is the opposite of pushing, which is what a stroke may be, which is a push. Oh my God, 45 minutes? Okay. No, 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 sorry. All the momentum. Nick is saying from can be transferred to the ball when the front pushes pushes off the ground, leading the hands, collecting the momentum like a golf swing. Hmm. Okay. Rado wants me to move on. Okay. Let's see if I can get this pull closed. Good call. I'm sorry. I'm I've lost my edge. Lost my edge. Here we go. So half of you want the goal. 40% of you want a free hit defense and 6% of you want to retake. That is as absolutely ambiguous as possible. Wow. <laughs> wow. Ambiguous, ambivalent, ambiguous. I don't know what I can say here because I feel that this is one of those unaddressed corners of our rules. It does not confer any kind of advantage whatsoever. And in applying common sense, which is always for me, the guiding principle, like I always try to get back to how does this affect what the player is able to do? Does it confer upon them an unfair advantage in this situation? To me, it absolutely does not. This is one of those rules that because dragging is not defined, because dragging has not been properly addressed under the rules, you have this silly thing, which is archaic, irrelevant, and really shouldn't matter whatsoever. So... If the rule was more, the back foot cannot step in front of the ball before it is played, that would take care of everything. So please give me the rule book. I'll rewrite it and everything will be fine. Um, let's see. And my mouse is migrating again. Okay. The, yeah, I'll just quickly address a couple of things. Uh, no, doesn't matter. And John whistle timing doesn't matter. We're not talking about if she takes the ball, if she plays the ball before the whistle blows. So that's completely relevant. Uh, sounds like a football offside in line is ahead. Still a goal for Simon. Okay. Yes. Okay, well, that was long. Let's move on. Because Rado has said, we're going to go into this video referral from Penalty Stroke. This, I thought, was not going to be interesting and then turned out to be more interesting than I expected. Popped up in the server, so thank you very much. I think it was Ben who pulled this one out. Okay, Iglesias doing a good job getting his teammate away. He's addressing it. Oh, 
So annoying. Team referral by Spain. Yep. They are looking for a penalty stroke inside the circle. Can you please scan? So their request is for a penalty stroke. So I'm letting you watch it. I'm gathering my thoughts as well. I'm looking forward to your thoughts. So there's an attempted interception here by the defender. The interesting part here is that I don't think they even had to ask for a penalty stroke. There is no goalkeeper for Australia. They're down a goal. They've pulled their goalkeeper. Whether they win a penalty corner or a penalty stroke gives them probably an equal chance to score. Because remember, if a penalty corner is called, the goalkeeper can't come back in. If a penalty stroke is called, the goalkeeper can come back in. So, which would you actually... What do you really need? So, Cookie was very clear in her language to make sure she said penalty corner. And Ragu was penalty corner. Okay, got it. They got that. So we have four separate sort of issues in this play that I can see. The first one being on the aerial, the clear initial receiver is the Spanish attacker. And the attempted interception is within five meters, within playing distance, and is dangerous and is a free hit. However, what you would hope is that advantage can be played here because what you actually don't wanna do, and I'm not talking about what actually happened here, but I want you to put together all the pieces in your mind if something similar to this happens for you. Because you don't want to hinder the attacking team with the necessity of stopping the ball in the right place, making sure it goes five meters before it goes inside the circle. What is the best option for the fouled team here? They can play on from this. Okay, the best option is to not have to play a free hit. The best option is just to keep going because the overrunning attempted interceptor is out of the picture. So let the player go, just, just let them go. Okay, so that's the first thing I want you to think about. How is advantage changed when the foul is inside the five meter dotted line and the consequences of that? Okay, and then you, we can talk about if you, if you have awarded a free hit here, does the ball go five meters before it goes into the circle? It's close. But I think it's there because there's a little bit of change of direction. It's not straight at the circle. And then right at the last second, there's a li little bit of an angle off. So if the ball is this far inside of the dotted line and then it goes a little bit that way, I think it's five meters. So that wouldn't have been overturned. That's issue number two. And then you get to the defender action here. So 
what I want you to focus on, I'm not sure if everybody's looking at that, but that is the ground on which Spain actually makes their request for a penalty stroke. They believe that this is a push by the defender that brings the Spanish attacker to ground. He also happens to be in the act of shooting, which might actually bring in the probable goal scenario. Do we all think that this is a probable goal? If this is an accidental foul, could this be a probable goal? Is this around 75% chance if the foul doesn't occur that the player is going to score this? When there is only one Australian defender in between the shooter and the net and there is no goalkeeper? Maybe not 75% chance. The problem with the camera angles that we have in this scenario is this is the angle we want and we want this to pan right now so that we can see the push by the defender that's coming up right here. So great move by the attacker. They plant, they're going to curl. The defender overruns and right here, look at the body position of the defender and whether they are making an effort to play the ball even at this moment, or are they overextended? Are they just moving past? And as Charlie's pointing out on the, um, on the commentary here, that elbow. If you see this, what is your decision in this particular moment? Is that a penalty corner or is it a reckless foul intended to break down the play or reckless as to whether it's going to break down the play? Okay. Let's see what your comments are. Ferrado, yes, it's a deliberate foul in the circle. Penalty stroke, push in the back by the defender, but could only see that in slow-mo. With no goalkeeper, you might have appealed for the penalty corner. Did you mean penalty stroke, Gideon? Good to see you, by the way. Conrad, deliberate push in the back is a penalty stroke. Youp is an attacking team. Why not ask for the PC? And then if you get a PC, fine. If you get a PC penalty stroke, also fine. Don't you still lose your referral if you ask for a penalty stroke and get a PC? No. So that was my first sort of thought as well. But the video referral regulations say that if they get a better result than what was originally called on the field, their referral is in essence upheld. So you can ask for a penalty stroke. This is a this is a play on situation. Ragu doesn't call anything, or he he calls the free hit for the heinous tackle there. Okay, so the the result that they had in their moment was play on. So the fact that that is overturned and they intent instead receive a penalty corner is enough that they keep the referral. So. Stain, you hear what I say, but the video umpire should award what she deems right and not what the referring team asks. Yeah. And the question is, is this the best decision? Shane, where you been? It's a penalty stroke and a card for you. Yeah, could be a card. I don't know what's happened in the rest of the game. And it's intentional for Rachel. Played on from original foul, then the defender... It, it deliberately pushes the attacker um, 24A if not deliberate pushing or B if deliberate. So you, Blair, you would say that this is a probable goal scoring opportunity that's been taken away by the foul. You should say PC because you think there's a defender behind. That's not the criterion app. I can, I will link up here, there will be up in that direction. 
in that direction, I will put up a link to another What Up Wednesday where I talk about whether the existence of a defender behind negates any probability of a goal being scored. Spoiler alert, it doesn't. What we're looking for is a probable goal. The existence of defenders and their positioning is only a factor to consider. But the fact that that defender is a field player, is not a goalkeeper, there's only one of them, there's quite a distance between them, between the ball and where the defender is. So if this Spanish player doesn't get taken down and is able to do a spinning flick on goal, is there a 75%-ish chance that he's going to score that goal? Maybe. But just because the defender's there, that does not negate any chance of a probable goal. Let's get that right. It's not accidental. Okay. You meant a PC with no goalkeeper present is possibly a better option than a penalty stroke with a card. Yeah, with a goalkeeper subbed on. Yeah, possibly, possibly. It's, you know, I'd like to see some stats on that. I'd like to see how many times a penalty corner without a goalkeeper is successfully defended by that team. I don't know. And Australia already have a player off with a yellow card. Yeah, probably. Stroke. Alistair, deliver in your opinion. Okay, what are the considerations for carding the player to make making a dangerous attempt at an interception? Good question, Alistair. So the things that I've been teasing out from all of the examples that we've been looking at over sort of the past year of attempted interceptions are that you're looking for not necessarily... I mean, obviously, if a player comes running in and they're swinging their stick and it's highly actually like danger dangerous you've got another set of considerations there that this is just one of those he's not doing it right and that makes it more dangerous but it's not actually a he's going crazy kind of dangerous dude okay my words are bad in that i'm sure you can piece it together what we're looking for when we're thinking about carding those scenarios i mean that could have been a penalty corner right in and of itself that aerial interception if you believe that the player the defender has everything in their sights they can see all of the things and that and that that wasn't a reasonable attempt at an interception they're just trying to stop the play because they can calculate, they can see that the initial defender is there, they can see where the landing point is, and there's just no way. Like, they're just coming to stop things from happening. For me, this is not... I think it would be a tough call to say that, that he didn't try to intercept that ball outside of the dangerous area. He just didn't get there. Just didn't quite get there. And they have to commit four or five, maybe even six seconds before the moment of the attempted interception. So they can get those numbers wrong. The math may not math and they can make that mistake. It's when a player clearly runs at the initial receiver and is just getting in their face and intentionally infringing the five meters. When there's an attempt to get in front of the ball, then I don't think I would penalize it as an intentional breakdown and then look at a penalty corner and a card, if that helps. And then Alistair, for me, like this isn't one of those reckless physical plays. Okay, defender for you, Goddard, is not trying to play the ball against the attacker in possession. Conrad with the push, the attacker is now falling off the ball, denying a clean hit, so losing power with a shot on a goal. Yeah, there's a clear disadvantage there, I think. And so the question is, are we, are we looking that, at that action of the defender's recklessness to the result, which was to deny the attacker a clean hit. There's no goalkeeper, David, because they pulled that player off because they were trying to equalize. So they, they pulled the goalkeeper off and put a field player in his place. You're on the defender doesn't put his stick down to stop the ball, but he does stop running to block the attacker. That's what makes it intentional. So a penalty stroke, not physical enough for a card for you. Yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't think this is you know, very physical.
Little coughsters there. Little coughsters. Okay. Let's, uh, let's trigger the two minute warning. And see what we got. Okay, so this is from the last one. Ignore it. And I will bring on this beautiful set of stats. Thank you, YouTube, for all of your help. Oops. Thank you, YouTube, for your help. And 70% of you were looking for a penalty stroke on this and a corner for 25%. And play on. You didn't see any foul whatsoever in that defender action. Hmm. Just adjusting those, adjusting those glasses. 70% of you got it right. <laughs> I mean, if you're going to say it that way. Yes. Okay. Lots of things to work through. Lots of little steps. And there's ways in which you can anticipate in that moment when that arrow's going up and that ball is going left to right across you, which is a very difficult place to be gauging an aerial you should be thinking to yourself this defender is going to break it down there's no goalkeeper you know they're going to try everything they can to make sure what what could happen if there's a breakdown here and i was talking to simon milford about this in in uh our conversations about advantage and how to calculate you're anticipating what foul is going to occur and if that foul occurs where are the other players on the pitch? What, as he showed me, what um, possession, opportunity, space, and what was the other S? I can't remember. Skill is available to that player in order to do something with it. And so an advantage call here would have blown it out of the water. So. But really good, and I enjoyed that discussion. I think we got a lot of uh, nice things out of that, and lots of good learning points. Thank you very much for your participation. Okay, there were a couple announcements, and I've skipped them because I went so long on the first. Because don't I always? Okay, first thing I wanted to talk about before we get into topic three is that uh, I just wanted to let you all know that we are progressing really nicely towards our EHL development group that is going ahead in less than 30 days. Oh my God, I can't believe this is actually happening. The big news is that the EHCO, which is the European Hockey Club organization, is going to be putting on an under 19 club championship that is going to run in parallel with the EHL. And, you know, like I don't want to brag about how amazing we are, but maybe they thought, oh, we heard that FH umpires is bringing a development group to the EHL. I wonder if they might want to umpire some of the games. So we've been approached to provide some umpires. I don't know exactly how it's going to shake out. I don't know um, how many games we can do, when those games are going to be, all that sort of thing. But it's a wonderful opportunity for FH Empires as a community to represent. It's a great opportunity for the people participating in the development group that uh, I'm choosing to, to, to use in this capacity to, to put on the pitch. and. And I think it's just really, really cool that something like that can happen. So um, I will keep you advised of how that goes. Just to say that you never know what can happen when you take a chance and you put yourselves out there and you say, we're going to do this amazing thing and we're going to talk about it and we're going to let people know. And I have a sneaking suspicion that these development tours are going to become quite a uh quite a rich source of experience and fun for us in the future we're going to look at doing more and stay tuned if you want to know what this is all about you don't understand 
what the FHU3T yellow membership is or anything like that, just go to FHU3T or FHEmpires.com forward slash FHU3T is probably the best way to do it. And you can find more about yellow, but if you want to talk with everybody in the community about all the exciting things that are happening, that all happens in our Discord server. So please come along to the Discord server and check that out. And the other thing that I wanted to do was to send a big thank you to this fine gentleman. Um, I did it. I pointed the right way, you guys. Gary Ash bought me rosé a couple weeks ago to thank me for something. Something great that I did. I don't know. Does not matter now? Does it? What matters is that Gary is a great person and bought me a rosé. Thank you very much, Gary. I appreciate your support. I appreciate everybody's support. Those of you who are green members of FHE3T, you are making it possible with these just small incremental monthly contributions. You are making it possible for me to be able to keep giving free content to everybody in the world. And that means the world to me. So for everybody out there who can't afford mentorship, who can't afford the higher level of services and things like that, they still get a really great chance to learn because they're here and they can still keep coming to these live streams and they can still come into the server and they can ask questions and get lots of support. They can be part of the community and it's because of green members. So if yellow isn't the right choice for you right now, for whatever reason, maybe green is an option. So have a look at that and thank you very much for all that. There's the buy me coffee link as well. Thank you everybody for popping the links in. I also have PayPal and ETH and nah, FHEmpires.eth. Literally, you could send me ETH. How many of you have ETH? Does looking at GoPro footage class as video referral? Mm, probably not, but you could always make jokes. That push in the back was a Keeley special. Very difficult for either umpire to see where they were. Yeah. Yeah, it was. It was. It was a tough angle for sure. And yeah, very exciting, right? Just wait till we get to New Zealand for the Masters. Mm -mm, it's going to be good. Okay, let's move on. Topic three. Managing multiple cards. Australia, you just keep on giving. Let's have a look at this. No previous cards in the game. This isn't a poll question. I just wanted to show how important it is to get your cards right when they come up. Just a few seconds later, Australia is continuing to press. And before anything has even happened, Tomo, he's done. He stops the play in the middle when no fouls even occurred, and he's like, no, you two, gonzo. And then just a minute after that, this happens. Um, we have a near fatal injury on the field. I don't want to be a jerk, but come on. It's a difficult position for this to happen because it's right in front of, it's on the sideline, close there. It's all the coaches are around, all the officials, it's crowded, you can hear all the mic. And now Tomo's going to bring the Spanish captain over and watch how he manages okay and manages to get that resolved I don't know if you can really pick out on the graphics just how many cards have popped up there but there are basically four cards given within the span of two minutes, two of which are yellows. 
And so at the end of that little situation there, that was a yellow card to the Australian player for kicking the Spanish player in the face. <laughs> okay, yeah, technical tables are very useful in these situations. So before we get further on that replay, I'll just show you what it looked like with the cards that 39, 40, 40, 42. So within two, three minutes, and you can see that no cards occurred prior to that. I haven't had a chance to look through the match because you know what my first inkling would be is how did we go through two full halves and a bit, two full halves and another 10 minutes of a match that was going to be contentious because this is the second time that they've matched up in this little mini series in the pro league down in Australia without a card being awarded. And then we have that. So the question you should always ask yourself, if you are in this situation and you end up having to give out a spate of cards, two of which for fairly physical, quite physical incidences is what happened before this? Were there incidents that I either failed to see, my colleague and I did not see them, or we did not deal with them in what, in, in a way that would have prevented this from happening. And we talk a lot about game management tools and how you want to have um, a full tool set and things like that. In physical dangerous games, your tool set does include talking to players. It does include talking to captains, but that is those tools should not be used at the exclusion of cards. So at the conclusion of, you know, the last yellow card that David gives here, he has a conversation with the Spanish captain. I don't know what they said. There seemed to be a little bit of maybe warning and a little bit of, hey, going on here and a connection and expression of empathy. But notice that that didn't happen in place of cards. That happened in conjunction with cards. So too often we think, I'm going to talk to the captain, so it's going to be a good management step. It's not always enough. It's frequently not enough to do. We have to combine our management tools. And our other management tools include our calm physical presence, our ability to smile, our ability to say the right words to the captain at this moment and be able to get to a resolved state at the end, okay? So all of those things were there, okay? I know, right? <laughs> yeah, you New Zealanders, come on. Let's not get into that. Um, let's see, Stefan, Shatama waited for the next stop of play to card those first two players. And I think you mean the second players that came together 30 seconds after the slide tackle. Is it normal practice to stop play as he did? It's not normal practice. What message that sends right in that moment is, hey, I am really not happy with what occurred. What's interesting is that the play restarted with a 23 meter restart. Okay, so the incident happened inside the circle. We can kind of see the edge of it that they've been pushing and jostling. But if either there were simultaneous fouls or no foul occurred and play was stopped, then how do we restart play? Unfortunately, with the bully. But if what Tomo wanted to do was to stop the nonsense right away because he sees that control is being lost, absolutely give it. For example, I had to give a red card during a game when I was in Brazil. And I was able to play, to let play move away from me and the incident 
and wait until the ball had gone off the sideline because I was right there. I was on top of it. And I could make sure there was no retaliation. And I could see the ball was going out. So, you know, I was like mathing the math and said, okay, we're good. Stop. Boom. Pull out the red. But ordinarily, in many cases, you are not going to play advantage on a red card because things have to be bang. They have to be locked down. And clearly that's how Tomo reacted in that moment. And that probably was the best way to deal with what would have kept bubbling. And there would have been yells from both sides. Well, he did this and he did that. And if Australia goes on to bring the ball back into the circle, win a penalty corner, then they're going to be trying to refer what happened earlier and blah, blah, blah. It's just going to be all this messy garbage that Tomo doesn't want to deal with. And he wants to get the problem actors off the pitch before they can cause more problems for the game. I don't often like to see the match interrupted. I especially don't like to see bullies need to be warded, but I thought that was a very, it, it, it appears without knowing what would have happened, but for this intervention, I think it looked like a really good choice in that moment. Okay. I don't know. I don't know, but I always think about it. I always look back and this is, again, this is for us. How are we going to manage our games better? We need to apply those anal self analysis skills. We need to ask the coaches and players. So what happened? Did we miss stuff in the second quarter that we should have? Were you expecting to see cards for certain things? And maybe you remember certain instances and you say, I made a choice not to card that. I wonder if that was the wrong choice of something that happens early in the game. So go through that exercise. You have to be aware and you have to practice that reflection so that when you're in your next game, you don't keep making the mistake of deferring the opportunity that comes to you to seize control of the game and to manage it properly with the interventions. And I'm clapping again. Which Australian player got the yellow, the shoulder barge, or the step back and foot to the face, the step back and foot to the face. It was number 14. Hi, Purdy. Unclear what the second lot of cards was for. Um, yeah, it, it's hard to see. It doesn't get captured in the direction. But you can sort of see the, the last bit of a push inside the circle. Um, I think that they were wrestling and the Australian player probably got another good shove and then got out away and was able to get some separation of the ball. Let's just see if I, we can see it a little more clearly here. Okay, so the ball's back in play. Okay, so, oh yeah, if you can see. So what we're looking at is, oh, the frame rate in this is so bad. It's, it's those two players who have I'm sorry, I'm struggling with my video controls here. They are not cooperating because the frame rate is so bad. Okay, so it is those two players there. And I bet they've been handbagging each other for a, quite a several few seconds there. And as you can see, the... There's a little bit of, you know, the Spanish player stumbles and there's no reason for him to stumble unless there was a little bit of a push. But clearly they had been going back and forth enough that Tomo said, Ugh. Shoulder barge looks like a second yellow. Um, it could have been. It was definitely a breakdown. Like he, he is, he is interfering with that player's ability to get back to the ball intentional third party, whatever you want to call it. The second yellow was to Spain. No, um, there you go. Yep. It was the step back. Okay, cool. All right. So, and, and if anybody's wondering if that action by number 14 of Australia deserved that yellow card, he knew the guy was there. He's like, 
I'm going to step backwards because I'm entitled to do so. And I don't care if I kick him in the face. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> Not on this pitch. You don't get to do that. Okay. All right. Last topic that I wanted to get through to. I'm doing better getting into the, the things. Better into the things. What else did I want to talk about? Ah, two more announcements before I get to the last one. First of all, I want to give a shout out to Jules. Jules is the umpire coordinator at Caridon Hockey Club Association. I can't remember. Apparently, Jules watches quite frequently on replay. So Jules, I want to say hi. I want to say, come on to the Discord server. I would love to meet you. I'd love to know more about you. And I would love to talk to you. So Jules, shout out. Thank you for being a watcher, listener, lurker, observer. We're not supposed to call lurking because lurking seems a little creepy. So observer, thank you for being out there. And the last thing is, if you are a person who would like to help out FH umpires a little bit, you are in the UK and you have, I don't know, you got some storage space that you're like, boy, wouldn't some nice Tupperware bins of umpire shirts and whistles and cards look really good in this corner of my garage? Wouldn't that, wouldn't they just look really good there? If you are interested in helping out and being compensated for helping with fulfillment of e-commerce orders, I would like to talk to you. I'm going to be putting up a form in the server and we're going to target a level where basically you're going to be taking the margin of the retail goods. <laughs> Whatever margin exists, you're going to get it. Um, and I will obviously pay for the shipping materials and things like that. But 80% of FH Empire's orders come from within the UK. My current warehousing solution is no longer, no longer going to be viable starting in August because Printful has decided that they're going to charge $150 US per month for warehousing when I have been previously paying $30 US a month. Guess who can't afford that? This girl. So. If that is something that sounds cool, if you've been looking for a way that you wanted to be able to contribute and you will uh, get some compensation for your time and a whole lot of appreciation, um, come into the server and I will be posting that within the next, let's say six hours. Denman, are you going to stick me to six hours? Yeah, you will. Okay. Oh, oh. Oh, Shane, Shane, this is shameful, isn't it? I don't usually um, do this part, but I am going to ask if there's so many people watching, I'd love, just let me know. The most important thing to me is that you engage in the comments because I like to hear what you're thinking, how you're thinking, because it helps me be a better teacher. It helps me think of things that I didn't know before. It helps me provide better for this community. So every comment you make, that's why I make sure I go through every one of them because I know it's a learning opportunity for me and it's a learning opportunity for all of us together. So get in the comments, but while you're there, you could just, you could just, just hit that. Oh, it didn't work. What? There. Smack that like button smack it. Yeah, I do think you're going to be awake in six hours because you've been doing that on the regular for the last few days. Okay. Last topic. Proactive communication versus coaching. Let's do it. Oh, now the likes are pulling it. Apparently, if you ask, you shall receive. Thanks, everybody. So we had a conversation pop up in the server and, and it sort of went through a few different sort of examples and topics, but the instigator of this conversation was about when the ball has not left the circle on the injection of the penalty corner and what we're supposed to do about it. Now y'all know that this is one of my least favorite rules in the rule book is that it is not a foul to continue play or even to shoot at goal. If the ball has not left the circle, it simply can't be a goal as 
Hamish so eloquently states in his post here. And then the question that William uh, asks here is, do you not say not out or something along those lines? And then we had a conversation about what it means when you make those statements and you, you use that style of communication. The question being, are you potentially advantaging one team over another because you are indicating what you've seen, even though no fouls occurred? And I think it's worth us having a conversation about that because I believe that it's our responsibility and it's the best way to umpire a game is to be proactive and tell the players what you've seen. And remember, you're not walking up to one set of players and whispering there going, hey, that ball didn't go out. You might want to deal with that. Okay. That is both giving only one team the information and then telling them what to do about it. So for me, that is not, that crosses the line. That gets to the coaching area, which is explicitly against the rules under rule 10 something. Do I have to go back and find it? Oh, uh, is it 10? I can't remember. Conduct to play umpires. No. <laughs> ay, 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 ay. There we go. Um, umpires are not supposed to coach. I thought it was under 11. Oh yeah, there it is. It's underneath. Sorry, it's underneath my little thing. 11-7. Umpires mu must not coach during the match. So understanding that, knowing that we can't coach during the that we can't coach during the match, but telling players if the ball hasn't moved five yet by simply saying, not five, not five, telling the players that they haven't moved back five meters from the spot of the free hit, that's not five, one more step, one more step. I mean, you could argue that that is quite instructive when you say one more step rather than telling them just that they simply haven't complied with the five meter rule yet. But we do these things because we're not here to capture or catch players doing things wrong. We're here to show them how to play a better game that requires less of our interventions. So remember that the number of times that it would happen in a game that a ball wouldn't leave the circle on a penalty corner is probably maybe once. If it's happening on the regular, well, you've got a different set of problems included in your 99 and, and we can talk about that too. And all you're doing is informing both teams that the ball has not left the circle. I, as a player, love that. I love knowing what the umpire is looking at because whether they're right or wrong, sometimes I might think that they're wrong. I know what I, what choices I can then make. So if I were defending that penalty corner and the umpire says, not out yet, you know what I would do if I was, had my druthers about me as I'd start defending the outlet lines. I'd start pressing the opposite way. How confusing would that be for the attackers? Because all they really want to do is to get the ball out or earn another penalty corner. But they're trying to move it out. If they shoot towards the goal, yay, go nuts. At the worst, the ball deflects off my goalkeeper and goes in the goal. And then a 23 meter restart is awarded. Actually, that's not the worst. The worst is that we give up a pel another penalty corner. But terrific. If my goalkeeper is smart and clever and just steps aside because they've heard that the umpire declare that the ball is not out yet, awesome. That is not an advantage to the attacking team. 
That is information that both teams can take and do something with to make a better flowing, more constructive game. And that gets back to what my overall modus operandi is on the pitch, which is I'm there to make a great game, the best game that those players can play on that day. And everything I can do in service to that purpose, I'm doing the right thing. Um, let's see what you're saying in the comments. Thank you, Conrad. <laughs> this is what happens when I don't prepare certain things. There you go. Oh, you know, y'all looking at the numbers. I'm trying not to think about it because I've been gaining 15 subscribers a week for three and a half years. I just, it just doesn't, it's okay. Um, and I think I told my mentor group or my mastermind group, I said, yeah, I'm going to hit 2000 subscribers, you know, the, the third week of March. And they're like, really? You know that? I'm like, yep because it's math. Anyway, Nick, you're proactive, ball out. I'm talking to my colleague, myself and local players. If the ball isn't out, I'll have said ball not out. My colleague knows, I know, and local players know. Okay, Just, yeah. And it's good because it helps you grease your mind to make the next decision because you've literally led yourself down the path of this thing's gonna happen. Just like if you say you're playing advantage and you say, I'm coming back to that because you're going to come back and you're going to award a personal penalty, but the team penalty was at a bad time and it was a much better option for the foul team to continue play. When you say that you are committed and you will not forget. And even if you have to wait 35, 45, a minute worth of seconds, 60 seconds in order to come back to that card. You've committed it out loud to yourself and to everybody who's heard you. And it's the right thing to do because you don't want to back out of that decision because it was the right decision to make the best decision you could make in that moment. Okay. Shh. We're not talking about Amsterdam coffee shops. You, you've never told players the ball didn't leave the circle. You think it mainly has to do with that most of the time you don't have time to communicate it and you're focused on what's happening, but you're not against it. And that's you. That's totally fine. Sometimes things are happening too quickly. But part of our superpowers are developing the ability to go through a checklist of the things that could happen before they happen so that we're prepared for what we might need to do. So for example, when the players have to shift off their lines in order to receive the ball at the top of the circle on the injection, that's a really good time for you to think that that ball may not have gone outside the circle because of how the angles change as soon as the, the players shift several centimeters that way or several centimeters the other way. I can't remember exactly how it works. I have to see it. But you see how that's a that's a, a, a way that you can start preparing. And then when you're prepared for it, if you're not reacting to what's happening on the pitch, you can get your vocal instructions in. It's when you're like, oh, I think the ball may not have gone outside the circle. Gee, what happened? Oh, was that a foot? Oh, and you're, you're just, you're catching up. You're catching up. The game has moved past you. You need to be ahead of the game all the time. Uh, Shane, you verbalize what you're seeing as a way of checking off the things that need to occur to be valid play. Excellent. Yes. I have heard players or I've heard umpires and I have done this myself at times where I've said, yep, that's so, you know, I've said, okay, injection good or nobody's early balls outside. Boom, boom, boom. And you go through the steps. And just like Shane said, you're checking off. Yes. This corner is proceeding the way it should. Uh, Gideon, in this example, it's beneficial to both teams. So communicate. The one you like less is saying the full-time whistle will go during a PC as it only benefits the attackers who bring their whole team up. I guess the, the, the thing that you have to consider in that situation, I did take a long pause to think about it because it's a good point, but the, the real issue 
is that you want both teams to understand that they have to keep playing if the corner has not been completed. So if the horn goes, you have to blow time because technically you should be blowing time during the corner if it's not complete, if time has expired. Okay. I know we handle it a little differently in practice. I get that. But the point is that you're encouraging the players to keep going, both teams. And it's a safety issue that both teams continue to play. So that to me overrides the, oh, they can bring up a bunch of players and, and that sort of thing. Okay. Kat, you prefer to make sure there's no surprises. Yep. You don't want the players to be surprised by your decisions, so you do tell them. Agree. Alistair, it's a very, very academic question. Can a shot be considered to be a shot on goal if no shot can, if a goal can be scored due, if the goal can't be scored due to the ball not leaving the circle? And the answer is yes, because it's the intention of the attacker. To playing the ball towards the goal, intending to score. It is a very academic question that I hate too. Thanks for noticing, <laughs> Stain. This is during play. The attacking team gains more advantage than the defenders. That looks different to you than shouting advantage during play before or correcting before play resumes. I disagree. I disagree. If that's, if, if, if you're talking about the, the ball not leaving the circle, no. It's, 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 it's the same amount of information. And if one team chooses not to think critically about what they should be doing, as a result of that information, then that's not good enough. Yeah. Uh, Simon, you called a PC over a six aside final when the ball had gone three meters from the D. Attack came in, top corner shot to win the final. Losing coach wasn't happy. So called a PC over. So you ended the penalty corner. Yeah. I don't know what your six aside rules might have been. So all I know is that you're sharing a moment that wasn't fun and I'm not passing any things. Ben, ditto to what you've said. You don't often have the time to make the shout. You'll know if it has or hasn't, but the time to react and call often means the ball is gone. And ball has gone. I don't know if that, if you mean that's been a shot or not, but. There you go. But hopefully what I said earlier kind of helps you address that. And the question is if, I mean, if it's, if it's the stop and it hasn't happened outside and, and the drag flick is gone, the, 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 the straight hit has gone, the hit to the layoff deflection in has gone. Sure. <laughs> You're right. You don't have enough time, but often there's, you know, a little bit because something has, there has been some sort of mishap that's caused that ball not to come outside the circle and just communicating to everybody that you've seen it, that it's not out and then they make their choices. That's the key. So I'll just end the poll so I can see what everybody has said here. Cause I'm curious, only 53% of you are saying yes, that you would communicate that to the players. I would invite the other percentage of you to reevaluate that. I would strongly, when it's possible, do it and try it. Being a proactive trusted umpire and players believing in what you're able to tell them that you're there to help them play a great game goes miles, miles on the pitch. The players know the difference. They can tell. And you want to be that kind of umpire who's there to help. Thanks very much for joining in today. A few minutes over. I did all right. Uh, don't forget, make sure that you get into the... Um, sorry, I'm just looking down at my screen and realizing that everything's wrong. Make sure you get into the Discord server. We're having great conversations. I'm really enjoying everything. We have a we have a, a FHU fit section thread that's going on like gangbusters. Should be in its own channel, but it's too late now. I can't make it its own channel. It's just a thread that's gonna live forever. Off topic is always hot. 
but the Q&A is always doing well if you want to bring forward scenarios and that's where I try to draw my material for FHU from. So please do head in there and say, I saw this thing, this thing happened to me. If you have video, I'd love to see it. And we will keep working things out together and talking for a Keeley hour every Wednesday on these streams. So thank you very much for coming along and we'll see you next week. Bye.